So my title kind of uh, bookends my experiences in astronomy, at least so far, to answer a question that I've almost everybody asked everybody else. I have not yet retired. I love what I do, and I'm going to continue it. Um, so I picked a couple gee whiz topics from both ends of, of where I was. Oops. Um, I want to start before I t tackle those topics along the same line as I've heard people talk about why mud and you know what what the connection is with Harvey Mud. And uh, when I was at Mud, we had the four majors. So what Bruce presented uh, sort of ties in. I, I might have been the one percent Hispanic, <laughs> and. Um, they did not have computer science. I had just discovered computers when I came to MUD. If, if they'd had a computer science program, I would probably be a computer scientist. But I was a physicist, and I did, did a math as a side. And the other interesting anecdote is that, so I had this degree in physics, and I applied to all these physics schools, graduate programs, and at the University of California, at each campus, you could only apply to one department. So for reasons I don't remember, I, for Berkeley, I applied to astronomy. The only one I applied for astronomy. And all of the physics institutions, the big ones, it was very impersonal. And the astronomy department at Berkeley, the faculty wrote me. They sent me their preprints. The uh, department secretary called up and said, if you come here, you'll, you'll be supported. You'll be TAs, RAs. Don't worry about that. And I was so impressed by the personal nature of that that I became an astronomer. That's why I'm an, uh, an astronomer. And what's interesting is one of our classmates, Bob Lewis, and I didn't know that either, uh, I showed up at Berkeley, and of the four people that got into Berkeley in the astronomy department, it was Bob Lewis and me, who were two of them. Um, in this talk, I'm not going to type dive any deeply into any kind of deep science, uh, but I do want to connect it to the different majors. As I said, there was four majors when we were there, uh, and then the humanities and independent study, of course. Um, but I'm going to tie it to all of them so I have a little bit of something for all of, all of you. Physics, chemistry, engineering, they're all part of what I've done. And I also want to tie it into uh, the ex let's, let's try it this way. There. Um, tie it into our, our classmates. So one of the things that I valued at Harvey Mudd was we, I would stay up late at night with my, my roommates, and we would talk about all kinds of things, just full sessions. And one of the, my roommate for four years, my best friend, Rob Freitas, and after we got out, he, was, he had a chemistry degree, and he went on to study law. But we still did, got together and talked about all of the gee whiz things, and we got to talking about uh, aliens. And the, the story at the time is... You, we would contact aliens by radio because it's too hard to travel between planets. So we said, is that really true? Can we bring science to that? And we worked together and we wrote a paper um, it, showing that actually in communications, information theory, sending a probe is actually more efficient in, in, in ways. And why, why not? It can be done. And so we came up with a program. So we wrote a paper and I'm really impressed that I keep seeing citations to that. It was not mainstream science. Um, but we decided to take a, a search for that. And one of the things that, that these alien parts that I'm going to talk about is that at the time, considering aliens was not considered uh, really good science, people would, would scoff. And actually, Congress was against uh, SETI and tried to cut their funding at one point. So we had to find a dual way to sell this, to say, we can get good science out, and we can do a little bit of this search. So all, all of these were trying to be clever about combining both so we could sell it to the, to the uh, time allocation committees. And so we did this project um, to look for, I mean, uh, well, first we did it on a small telescope uh, at, at, at the university. This was after I got out of graduate school. Oops, wrong way. And then later we repeated it with a big telescope at the National Observatory, where I now work. So the idea is that if, the, if some alien race sent a probe to examine the, the planets in our solar system, and they wanted to do that for a really long period of time, they'd put themselves in an orbit that wouldn't require a lot of energy to stay in. And one of those is the Lagrangian points of the Earth-Moon system. Um, 
It's actually more complicated because the, the influence of the sun actually causes little orbits around those Lagrangian points. But the point, what we wanted to do was to look there and say, somebody sent a small probe, and parked it there for a million years, and was watching the Earth. Could we, could we detect it with, a, with a, a telescope? So we went out and we looked, and the, the telescope on the left was old photographic film, and the telescope on the right, we used actual astronomical plates. Astronomic plates are no longer used, now it's digital. Um, and uh, explored that. And what I also want to tie is that some of these things then come around. So back in the 80s, this was considered kind of woo-woo in some ways. But two things that have happened recently, now they're talking seriously about Project Starshot, which is to send a probe to our nearest star. It's showing it being accelerated by a laser. And then something else that happened recently is the first visitor from outside our solar system. They thought it was maybe a rendezvous Rama, but it was a, a, an asteroid, or at least we still believe it's an asteroid. People talk about sending a, a spacecraft to it, but we're, it went by too fast. It's an asteroid called Oumuamua, and it's the first of its class, which is an interstellar asteroid. So the other one, after that, we said, okay, so we, we are advocating for the search for extraterrestrial artifacts, but let's also see, be clever about looking for signs remotely. And um, so we came up with the idea of looking at a, at a frequency, a radio frequency that would be clearly uh, artificial, but if it was found and it wasn't artificial, it would also be really interesting. So this is us at Hat Creek Observatory, which is near Mount Lassen. And uh, we got time by writing a proposal that said we were going to look for tritium. And the interesting thing about uh, tritium is at the time there was this thing about the water hole. The lowest noise part of the spectrum, at least from the electromagnetic spectrum from the ground, is in the microwave region. And that's where the neutral hydrogen line is strong, and we mapped the, the galaxy that way. I had something to do with that. And then the hydroxyl, and that, they call it the water hole. Maybe aliens are going to be transmitting in the water hole. Um, what we asked was, well, tritium is, a, is an isotope of hydrogen. It has the same kind of transition. Can we find it? And the thing that made it interesting is that it has a, it's radioactive, a 13-year half-life. So if, it's, if, you, if we find it in a naturally occurring way, that would be a very interesting process. Or uh, if, we, if, if it's artificial, um, that would, of course, be very interesting, too. So we proposed to search for tritium around the nearby stars. We got the telescope time. We went out and did that. And we didn't find anything. The argument we made for the artificial part was that suppose a more advanced civilization had manufacturing in space, and they used nuclear fusion, tritium as a, as a byproduct and, and a fuel for some fusion uh, reactions, and maybe a little bit of it leaks, and then we can detect it with our big radio telescopes. Then to come, come full circle to now, people are now able to find and measure uh, exoplanets and the atmosphere. So this is the chemistry component that I was talking about. Uh, and so one thing that people are doing now is trying to see if they can detect lines of, of oxygen or, or other things in, in, in uh, planets, exoplanets of, around stars. It's a hard process, but we're getting better and better at it. So now to jump from in the 80s when I was doing this with Rob uh, to worries about the devastation of the Earth. So we all have discovered that, that the dinosaur extinction was caused by the uh, impact of a not a very large but a significantly large asteroid. And um, so that's one of the dangers for uh, extinction on our planet. And that's recognized by NASA, by the governments around the world, that this is possible and we're at the point where we can try and see and find uh, how many of those there are. Um, just to give you a sense of scale, so something about 10 kilometers is what hit uh, the Earth that, that uh, caused the dinosaurs to go extinct. 
and let open the door for us, then there are smaller size rocks like or asteroids. They're not all rocky, they're also icy. Um, one that's 30 to 40 meters is thought to be what flattened a big part of the forest in Siberia 19, in the early 1900s. And then something as small as 15 meters uh, happened uh, about 20 years ago, I think now, uh, Chelyabinsk, and it went through the atmosphere, it didn't actually hit the ground, but the, ex the subsequent explosion blasted out all the windows in that town. A lot of people had to be treated for that. So the question is, um, how many are there? Just another sense of scale. We are now able to go to these asteroids with, with probes, uh, satellite uh, explorers, and one is currently at the asteroid Bennu, which is a, a near-Earth asteroid, one that comes near the Earth. And it's, it's not that big, but if that were to hit the Earth, it would be bad, significantly bad. So I got involved with searching for asteroids. The picture on the upper right is, is a four-meter telescope in Chile. Marty might recognize it. it. They're the twin of it she worked with in, in Kapit. There's two of them at these four-meter ones. And uh, so compare the picture of me before, black hair. Here I am with the white hair and the, in the control room. Back in the 80s, we stayed outside in the cold and used photographic plates. Now we use digital cameras, lots and lots of computers. Nothing can be done in astronomy without computers now. And uh, cameras. So there's this camera. The telescope is, used to be one of the biggest in the world. Now it's kind of ho-hum in a way. Uh, but it has one of the best cameras in the world now. The camera technology has allowed us to take telescopes and make them 100, 1,000 times more sensitive than they were when we used photographic plates. And so this camera has, it's a gigapixel camera. So each one of those little squares is a piece of silicon that's roughly the size of what might be in a digital camera. And a lot of my work has been uh, processing that data. So it's a lot of image processing, calibration. But I use this camera to look for asteroids. And the way it's done, you take multiple pictures, you do some image processing, you write some software. A lot of the work that I've, I've done in my career has been writing uh, software for analyzing pictures and automatic uh, identifying things in them, measuring all the stars, cataloging them. Uh, so this is related to that. Take just this sequence of five exposures, find the things that move, you found an asteroid. One of the first things we found in the survey, we had a three-year survey, 30 nights worth, and one of the first things we found and reported it to the Minor Planet Center was Gaia. Gaia is an uh, important uh, satellite that is transforming our, our precision of the position of the stars in the sky. So, uh, and then another one I wanted to show you, uh, again, you look at it, it's okay, a spot that's moving. Uh, big deal. This particular one was Starman. <laughs> uh, shortly after, after it got launched. So we took these pictures with this big camera for 30 nights, uh, generated petabytes of pictures, scanned through them all, counted all the things we found, and uh, the point was to try and uh, understand the, the density and then the probability of, of impacts. So here's a graph, sorry. Um, what is known is that it, let's see if this works. What is known is this, and this is a cumulative uh, plot, and then forget about magnitudes, look at the numbers up here. This is roughly the diameter, depends on how reflective they are. So that, a kilometer rocks, 10 meters, and it's smaller, and here I put the, uh, Dinosaur extinction one that, that would, was actually, it's way over here. Tunguska would be over here, Chelyabinsk, and the nuclear Hiroshima bombs have the energy way over here. So we're talking, all these here, any of these, if they impact the Earth, would cause some kind of uh, devastation, at least beyond here. Um, so the question, this is the math part and the statistics, how do you take this knowledge 
and figure out what the true distribution is. And so again, going through statistics and all, I, I came up with this line, which disagreed with the, many of the earlier or the current other estimates. Um, and in particular, so I said how countries and our country has gotten into, there's a planetary defense uh, program in NASA, no, I, or I think maybe Department of Defense, I'm not sure, they just had their meeting and Congress had a mandate to find all uh, asteroids bigger than a kilometer and that we're doing very well. We, we know almost all the kilometer size rocks in space that, that are approach the Earth. So we're probably uh, not going to be hit again by an extinction causing one unless the one that we somehow missed comes in. Um, but our knowledge over here, so this is log scale, so we're talking about millions and billions. Uh, this, this difference, so the, the, after all of that has been done, the next mandate was to find all the asteroids that are bigger than about 140 uh, meters. So somewhere in here, and there's a big discrepancy, it's a factor of seven. So that, that's my latest work was uh, saying, I, I believe there's a lot more than people have found and uh, I guess I had to, so it's, it's this area. So that's what I've been doing from aliens to asteroids and a lot of stuff in between, uh, gravitational lensing. Uh, that I wanted to say about astronomy, is why I'm so glad I got into astronomy, is unlike physics where you tend to study very small things, as an astronomer you still are pretty wide breadth. Um, so, I have been involved in everything from the, the moon, around the moon, to cosmology. And uh, if I were to be talking to students, I'd say astronomy is still great because it uh, capitalizes on your breadth of knowledge. You can use astronomy, I mean physics, your math, your computer science. Like I said, nothing can be done without computers. So I'm really glad I'm an astronomer. That's why I continue to do it. And uh, thank you.